and all, it was so different to anything that had been produced before that it was simply, I think, quite a natural thing for uh, the experts to say, my God, what's this? Throw it out. We don't understand this. At first they were very rude about it, but uh, I'm glad to say that after a few years and after the wine had uh, developed some age, they came to see the error of their ways. This is the story of some plucky upstart Aussie who traveled around a post-war Europe trying to figure out a new direction for Australian wine. He visited the vineyards of France, Italy, Spain, all the big dogs. And he had an epiphany. He knew the way forward, but when he came back home, he was laughed out of the room. Forced to work on a solo project in secret. Fast forward five years, and he unveils his creation to the world. The Royal Sydney Wine Show, where he swept the field, winning all the major categories and establishing a new world order in Australian winemaking. His name? Max Schubert and his wine, Penfold's Grey. Um, it's really good. I like it. Yeah, it's good. Max Schubert is the OG young gun of wine. He started at Penfolds in 1931 as a messenger boy at the age of 17. Odd job boy about the place. If anybody wanted anything done, particularly anything dirty, I used to yell out boy and uh, I would answer to that. He worked his way up to chief winemaker in 1948. And that's only at the age of 33. You know, his rapid rise wasn't necessarily due to being the ultimate company man either. From the start, he defied the wishes of management. He signed up for the armed forces during World War II when he served in Greece, Crete, Middle East and New Guinea, came home and after returning from the war, he would again find himself in Europe, not that far longer, only a couple of years. And this time at the request of Penfold, tasked with the grand mission to research sherry production in Spain. And once again, Max obeyed their orders at totally and said just screw that i'm gonna go straight to bordeaux right i went to bordeaux in the bordeaux area and uh, that's where i really became interested in uh, dry red production mainly because i was shown some magnificent wines there up to 50 60 years old and uh, i'd never seen wines like this before and I don't think I've seen any quite so good since. It was his trip to the mecca of first growth wines that inspired him during the vintage of 51 to craft his very first bottle of Grange. And Schubert himself stated, the method of production seemed fairly straightforward, but with several unorthodox features. Alrighty, uh, so quick word association. I say Grange, what do you say? Expensive. But, you know, it is, if you're going to buy the best, then, uh, or taste the best, then it costs you money to do it. But the problem is that people don't drink enough of it. The problem is that people buy it and stick it in cellars and don't drink the stuff. Okay, but what the bloody hell is Grange? Well, it's a blend of Syrah, or to be truly Australian, Shiraz. A Shiraz majority blended with a component of Cabernet Sauvignon. A not unusual blend in the context of Australian wine industry, but in the context of old word wine, incredibly unique. As the varieties originate from completely different parts of France. Cabernet coming from Bordeaux and Syrah from the Rhone Valley towards the south. Max Schubert took this already iconic Australian blend to new heights with Grange. In an unorthodox manner, Grange has always been sourced from a large area, not just one vineyard or region. Despite being vinified in South Australia, the grapes have been sourced from Western Australia, Victoria, even New South Wales. The concept of terroir, or place, or sense of place, is largely put to the side for Grange. Instead, Schubert focused on something that he valued more than terroir quality fruit. It was first of all based on finding the right material for the wine which I had designed. Maximum flavour of the varieties used. It would require material which came from vineyards that supplied an individual character. Schubert then used this immensely high quality fruit to craft a wine built to last 20 years. Much like the wines of Bordeaux that inspired it, the majority Shiraz brings this iconic full, rich and opulent body while Cabernet provides this intense and structural tannin that gifts the wine an incredibly long life. Resting in 100% brand new American oak for a whopping 18 months. In its youth, it can be overt, pronounced both in flavor and tannin, but given the proper time to rest, integrates seamlessly into the wine. Do you like it? I do like it, but what makes it so expensive? 
Now, New Oak was an entirely novel concept for Australian winemakers at the time. And after crafting this wine for a handful of years, a tasting behind closed doors with the directors yielded the complete unexpected, an order to completely halt all production. All in all, it was so different to anything that had been produced before that it was simply, I think, quite a natural thing for uh, the experts to say, my God, what's this? Throw it out. We don't understand this. He again defies the wishes of the managing directors and continued to make the wine in secret. These were the only vintages of Grange that didn't use new oak. It's actually, funnily enough, easier to hide a few barrels from management when there isn't a hefty price to pay for new wood. Then the unthinkable happens. Someone decided to enter the last Grange into the 62 Sydney Wine Show and it took out the entire damn thing. A seven year old wine forcing the hand of the directors to reinstate its production. And of course, no skin off Max's nose, he never stopped anyway. And the accolades for this wine never stopped, achieving no less than 50 gold medals across various vintages. His first Grange was the most expensive Australian wine ever to be sold at a nudge under $143,000 a bottle. The 55 Grange was named by Wine Spectator as one of the top 12 wines of the 20th century. The 71 Grange, was recognized by Fine Wine Magazine as the greatest wine of the 1970s. And the 1971 Wine Olympics held in Paris, 330 wines, 33 countries, judged by 62 experts across 10 different nationalities. It took out the Syrah category, blitzing the field. So Max Schubert, head winemaker at the age of 33, makes the first Grange at the age of 35, and the 55 Grange, one of the best wines of the 20th century he made at the age of 39. Schubert truly is the OG of young gun Aussie winemakers. Yeah, it's good. Not too acidic, a little bit lingering on the palate's good. Yeah, I like it. Would you pay $1,000 for it? Probably not a thousand, no. While the wine veers away from this established concept of terroir and leans into something more akin to an ideology that exists in Champagne, house style. An idea that by tasting a wine, you can immediately tell who has crafted it based on the oak use, the blend of the fruit, the time aging, rather than the vineyards and the region the fruit originated from. The intentional crafting of Grange in this cellar-worthy, collectible wine has established Grange to be revered as Australia's first growth, in reference to the most sought after and expensive wines of Bordeaux, like Chateau Margaux or Lafitte Rothschild. You know what? It tastes like every other wine that I've had. It just tastes like red wine. It's nice. It's good. Yeah. I'm I'm whelmed. I'm whelmed by it, but I will have some more. All of this has given Grange one thing, clout. In all honesty, this wine has transcended wine culture in a really similar way to other icons of their field. My mother, bless her heart, she has never watched a game of NBA in her life, but you ask her who the go-to basketball is, she'll say Michael Jordan. I've lived in South Australia for 40 years and it's at the pinnacle of what everybody knows about South Australia's wine industry. Um, which is both a good and a bad thing, I suspect. Similarly, for people my age and older, Grange has that household name brand recognition. Uh, so how do you know of Penfolds Grange? I've I guess I've always known about Penfolds because from here in SA, it's kind of a pretty big, pretty big name. I actually um, credit Grange for getting me the grades that I did back in primary school. It turns out in 2004, when uh, the state government was a little less strict about who could drink on school grounds, namely the teachers, my dad was running a Friday afternoon wine club, right? So he used to go in there every Friday afternoon and try and flog my teacher's piss from his cellar. Until one week, mum and dad got invited down to the Penfolds McGill estate. It was this swanky lunch where at the end you walked out with a little uh, party bag sort of thing. Rather than having little lollies or trinkets, this party bag had a bottle of Gitana and a bottle of Grange, the two most prestigious wines on Penfolds list. So next Friday, dad turns up at school, he's got two brown paper bags. Pours them all out and he goes, oh, do you like the red? Do you want the white? They go red or white. Gets to the end of it. So, who here has drunk Penfold's Grange before? And it was as if he just dropped an absolute bomb in the room. Everyone was agape. They, he pulled it out of the thing and it was as if they'd seen the Holy Grail. Now, that story points out that I was very privileged. I only got through school because dad greased the wheels for me, right? But the point I'm trying to make is, if you say the words Penfold Grange to someone in Australia while they're drinking a glass of red wine, even someone like me, they'll pay attention. It's nice. It reminds me of like a Tempranillo. It's like kind of not as heavy body as I thought. It's definitely like medium to heavy, like it's, it's teetering on it. Would you buy it? 
In this economy? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I wouldn't be purchasing a bottle of the Grange. Penfolds has always been a sizable force in Australian wine. By 1920, they had already commanded half of all sales of wine in Australia. There are more wine bottles bearing the Penfold label than any other brand of wine anywhere. Now, significant immigration into Australia post-World War II resulted in rapidly changing palates. The fortified wines that Penfolds was known for started to decline in popularity, hence Max's research trip to Europe. So it turns out, it worked pretty damn good. Wine and Spirits magazine recognised Penfolds as the winery of the year for the hmm, 23rd time. Uh, Schubert was included in Sydney Morning Herald's 100 Most Influential Australians of the Century. And today, celebrating 70 years of Penfolds Grange, a wine based majority on Shiraz before the market was ready for it, bucking the trend of sweet fortified wines, going against the wishes of Penfolds, coalescing into this apex of Australian wine, a multi-variety, multi-vineyard, multi-region blend that's been collected, cellared, and commands a whopping price point. It's quite simply remarkable, but like a one-of-a-kind wine fit for only the most like, special of occasions. If I say grain, what's the first word that pops into your head? Politicians. Tradition. Money. Nash. Wine. Beach. I, I don't know, green maybe? Overrated. Home. Expensive. Grange Road, baby. McGill Estate. Hermitage. South Australia. Penfolds has never been one to rest on their laurels, and they're doing their darndest to keep the finger on the pulse as far as trends are concerned. They celebrated the 70th anniversary of Grange by releasing a one in seven limited edition record player console. They're doing a bunch of NFTs with a company called Block Bar. If you take a peek at their Instagram, they've pivoted their wines as the perfect pairing with a game of Uno. They were even open to collaborating with startup YouTubers. Locally, they're definitely up for a challenge, as the majority of the populace in Australia shifts towards millennials, whose purchasing preferences are really different than what they're used to. It's likely why Treasury is committed to net zero by 2030, alongside the, you know, the morality of it all. Regardless, there is a change in the market of what Penfolds is used to. They don't have China anymore, or it's a younger drinking majority. But regardless, they're going to do exactly what they've done since 1844. Adapt and innovate.